I should have stood over there. <laughs> it's a long walk. You never, want, you never want your walk to the podium to outlast the clapping. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you for coming today. Uh, it's a, it is a really exciting day. It's very exciting to see all of you here. Uh, before I say anything else, I want to follow up on your remark a second ago, which is it's really important that we have the opportunity to save Hampshire College as an independent institution. <laughs> but it's also important to recognize that the work that was done last spring didn't save Hampshire College. It gave us the opportunity to save it. Right? And that's the work that we have to do now. Uh, and that's the work that we've been working on, the, the, the labor we've been engaged in in the spring, over the summer, and we'll be engaged in over the next several years. It's a, it'll be a long process, but we're going to make it happen. So thank you again for that. All of you who were asking questions of all different kinds on all various sides of these conversations, uh, we're here now because we were able to engage in that sometimes difficult conversation, uh, and hopefully we can continue to have that. So, thank you for that. All right, so, this is a really extraordinary time at Hampshire. Uh, it's also going to be a challenging one. Uh, as many of you have said to me in the, the last month that I've been here, Hampshire is a hard place. Uh, and it's a hard place by design. Hampshire is intended to push students to their academic limits, and it's intended to push communities to their limits. Uh, and this place has always done that, and will, I hope, continue to do that, uh, even when it's not always comfortable. And now we face a really extraordinary opportunity, uh, and one that will demand even harder decisions and harder work. So I want to thank everybody, particularly the students, for taking the risk of sticking with us and sticking with Hampshire College, knowing the challenges that are still ahead and knowing the work that's still to be done. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for returning. But also congratulations, because you are students, faculty, staff, and everybody else who's affiliated with this college, part of the most important ongoing experiment in higher education. And the risk and challenge and hard work and success of that experiment are why this place exists and it's why we're all here and it's what we do. Right? Hampshire College has an, an epic mission. Right? We're not just any college. It's an epic mission for students, for education, for the world. That fundamentally, the goal of this place is not just to provide the best education possible for every student who comes here, but to build the ideal education that everyone else should aspire to achieve. It's not to settle for compromise and safety, but to risk everything to build the best version of education. And it's to act with courage and creativity and vision where others can't or won't. Our job is to respond always to the changing condition and challenges of society and of the world and to aspire and hope to make the world better. And it's our job as Hampshire College to demonstrate that it's possible to do all of that and to make that experience available to everyone who seeks it and needs it. I came to Hampshire College because I believe in all of those things. I believe that Hampshire College is the essential institution of higher education. It has always been my ideal. I've said this over and over again, and I was saying it long before I was appointed the president of Hampshire College. What we do here is what everyone should try to do. At every institution I've ever worked, that's what I've tried to achieve. 
how far can I push an imperfect place to look more like Hampshire College? And now I get to be here at Hampshire College. Right? And so when I was watching last spring what looked like the potential end of this ideal for me, it was tragic. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, and, I, and I was genuinely distraught by the idea that Hampshire College might not exist anymore. Because if our system of education can't support Hampshire, it's not a system that I want to be a part of. So when I saw there was one final chance to prove that progressive, experimenting, student-driven education can thrive in the United States, I was compelled to apply and I was lucky enough to be selected to come try to take on this epic task together with you. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Okay, so that was lots of hyperbole, uh, all of which I believe. Uh, but I think, you know, given what we're doing today and the work we're launching into the fall, I want to think a little bit about the essence of the mission of our college and what we do. And I've spent a lot of time over the, over the summer with the founding documents and talking with some of the early students and faculty and then talking to people who went there in the 80s and 90s and then talking to recent students. And there's one constant that you see when you have conversations with everybody who's affiliated with Hampshire in lots of different ways. And it's that people see Hampshire as a place that is always trying to anticipate the next generation of students and the next generation of needs and to be, of, to re, to be responsive to what we will need next. But that's the kind of self-conception of Hampshire College. It's the place that's imagining what we're gonna need next and then trying to meet it. And that means a few things quite specifically, I think. Uh, one is that what Hampshire does in its academic program is, and this is my, my, my favorite phrase in all of the making of a college book, is curriculum by successive approximation. We're trying to approximate what we will need. We're trying to approximate how to teach and think and learn together to be ready for what's coming next. And we're never gonna get it completely right, but we're always gonna be trying to do it. And therefore, we're always gonna be changing and always going to be adjusting and always going to be flexible. Right? It's a really lovely idea for how a college should see itself. Second, always consistent about Hampshire, students guide their own path. Right? Students guide their own path. But the college both supports and challenges that path. Right? That part of the job of the staff and the faculty of this institution is to help students figure out where they want to go, but to push back against them uh, as they find that path themselves. Right? If you already knew what you needed to know, you wouldn't need to come here after all. Uh, a third element that seems really consistent is that the faculty at Hampshire College are teachers, mentors, co-learners, and guides. Right? That the people who work here are partners in education, not the people who deliver an education. And that's a really fundamental difference about Hampshire from everywhere else. Fourth difference, or a fourth consistency, problems and visions dictate the curricular paths of students, not disciplines. But questions are what drive the education of students in Hampshire College. And everything else is secondary to that, supports that. But this is a place where we try to answer questions, achieve visions, solve problems, and just find whatever tools and knowledge is necessary to advance that. Right? And then lastly, this is a place that's always willing to take risks and to engage in, another quote from the making of a college, strong and sudden efforts. So we do most of that very well. And we will continue to do all of that, I think, as we renew our commitment to be a bold and experimental college. But there's one element of the mission of Hampshire College, as it was envisioned 50 years ago, that gets less attention, uh, and we need to pay more attention to it now. And that's this part of the, of the mission. Let me just read a couple of short quotes from, uh, from Patterson and Longworth. 
You say early in the preface, the college will explore ways the private liberal arts institution may regain relevance, which we did and do, and do so within its own economic means. Right? That's like page three of the preface. Right? It goes on, a paragraph later. We must demonstrate that through innovation, it is possible for a private undergraduate college to achieve high quality without heavy continuing subsidy of its operation. Right? That was one of the fundamental missions of this place 50 years ago. People looked around and said, look, higher education 50 years ago was in a crisis. It's a different kind of crisis. We're always in a crisis. Right? Liberal arts colleges 50 years ago, like they are today, were in a crisis. And one of the fundamental goals of Hampshire College was to say, how do we find a way to do the best kind of education for the hundreds of colleges that don't have a huge accumulation of money to support them? How do we set an example? Right? Different way of putting that, our mission, and it's one we think we need to go back to and emphasize is to show that it's possible to be a rigorous, excellent, student-centered college without depending on massive accumulations of wealth. Or to put it a little bit more radically, the mission of Hampshire College is to combat the way that stratification, inequality, and obscene concentrations of wealth make private colleges machines to reproduce privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you all clapped because that's a really hard challenge, right? Uh, I mean it, I, I, I very much mean that, and I hope that, that everybody here and outside this room affirms that goal because it's a very hard thing to do, right? To, to not imitate the economic model of the 25 or so colleges that have massive endowments, but to show that liberal education can be done better and more creatively and democratically, and that lots of places could do that if they followed our model, that was part of what we were supposed to show the world. We gotta recover that, but we gotta recognize that recovering that will also in include making difficult choices about what we do and what we won't do. So this is what I've been trying to do, and you know, as I've been talking to people through the last what, almost a month, um, and emails I've been sending out to people, and trying to do it today is that is capture that that gap between excitement and enthusiasm in our best selves, and the recognition of the sometimes difficult choices we'll have to make together to realize those goals. And this is one of them. So with that hopeful and hopefully inspiring background, let me talk briefly about the task that we face this year and for the next couple of years. Right, for most of our history, we've been willing to find ways to match the costs of an outstanding program to the resources that we have available to us. And there have been challenges that it's been hard. You know, I talked to Adele Simmons about the things that she had to do to when, they, when, when the cost structure got unwieldy. I've talked to Greg Prince about some of the things that he had to do, right? we, but we've always managed to figure it out. And over the past several years, we've let that gap emerge again uh, in a, in a, to a degree that's bigger than it's been in the past. So the gap between our stable revenue, right, net tuition um, and some small auxiliary revenues, and how much we spend to run the college has gotten bigger and bigger. And I'll just give you some quick numbers on this. Uh, the gap between net student revenue and the amount we spent in 15-16 was 3.5 million. In 16-17, it was almost 6 million. In 18-19, it was 8.5 million. Last year, it was almost 9 million. Right? And this year's gap is a similar, it's about $9 million. That's not a sustainable model for delivering a creative, experimenting education that can show the world how to do liberal arts without a massive endowment. Right? So we've got to figure out a way to fix that. 
And I heard, and when I was watching from afar last year, I kept hearing this, this language that I found a little odd, which, which was Hampshire College kept being described in the kind of crisis version of Hampshire College as an under-endowed institution, right? As if there was a kind of a, a normal level of endowment that, that people should have, right? We're not an under-endowed institution. Hampshire College was never supposed to depend on those massive accumulations of wealth. Our charge is to be creative and make our model work with the means that we have. And that's what we've got to do, and that's what we'll do going forward. So, where were we last year? Last year we had a slowly developing crisis, I just gave you those numbers, um, that, was, I, I, that I think was being treated as exogenous to the college, as external, as something we couldn't do anything about, right? Why were we in a crisis? Well, it's because we're under-endowed, right? What can we do about that? Instead of a crisis that could be solvable through creativity and invention uh, and making difficult choices. Uh, and that led in a variety of ways to the decision not to take a class or, well, we took a class, there are 13 students who, despite all of our efforts, aside on those 13, I, I was thinking that they, they've talking to them over this week and it reminded me of the, the Elizabeth Warren moment in the Senate last year, the nevertheless she persisted. Um, I feel this very much about like these students, you know, we tried very hard to get them not to come. <laughs> and nevertheless they persisted and they insisted on coming to Hampshire College. So. But that decision to not take a full class has taken that slow-moving challenge that we should have been working on and would have had more time to work on and turned it into a genuine crisis. Right? I don't think Hampshire College was in a crisis last spring, but it is now. Right? And it's one that we're going to address and we're going to solve. We have to respond to it. And I'll talk in a minute about how we're going to, the mechanics of some of that. Uh, but before I step there, before I leave last year's event, I want to recognize that last year was traumatic and conflictual and there was a lot of difficult feelings and experiences on all sides of this, of this conversation and this debate. And I want to offer, I think briefly, a kind of an outside-inside perspective on this. As somebody who watched it from the outside as, with affection, um, and has now been on the inside for a month meeting many of the players. Here's what I think happened last year, right? Briefly. I believe that everybody, all sides, were trying to act in good faith. I think they were all trying to save what they most valued about Hampshire College. And I think what I, what you see from, what I saw from the outside is that there were different ideas about what's most important about Hampshire College. And those different ideas about what's most important about Hampshire College leads people to different conclusions about the best way to save it. But I genuinely believe that people who were acting on, both people who were protesting and people who were negotiating with other institutions were trying to do what they thought was best for this institution. And while I disagree that we can pursue our mission as a, without being an independent college, I think those people who were exploring the options of a partner, we're hoping to find a partner that would allow us to do that. Right? And I think part of what we learned from the recent disclosure of the, the internal documents from UMass is just how unlikely it is that any institution is gonna invite in troublemakers like us, right? <laughs> and let us be the Trojan horse that undermines everything that they do. Right? <laughs> and while I disagree I think there was a genuine belief that Hampshire College couldn't or wouldn't reinvent itself and that it couldn't or wouldn't survive on its own. Right? I think that we will. I think that the people in this room and around this campus and in our extended community will do the work and will make the hard choices and will write the big checks 
to make us survive. Right? But I could see why people coming into the place might not have believed that. And I could see why they might have thought, well, this has been a problem for a long time and we, they haven't done anything about it. Right? The question has been asked many times and there's been lots of talk about it, but no decisions have been made and reached the conclusion that it wasn't possible for this place to change. I don't believe that and I hope that I'm not proven wrong. Right? We'll find out. Uh, I believe that, oh, sorry. I believe that everyone who is here now is fully committed to building an independent Hampshire. Which means prioritizing the mission and values that make us distinct over any particular programs, interests, units, or communities. We've decided that that's what we're going to do. So we have to prioritize that. I believe that we will only be successful if we both recognize the trauma of the past year and the conflict that occurred while also accepting that that conflict was about competing visions for implementing shared values. Right? I'm not asking people to forget the past. I'm not asking people to stop thinking about the past. Right? The past is always there. And it will always be there. And it has shaped and formed everyone who was here last year. I am asking us to now view that through the lens of goodwill and charity so that we can do the work we need to do going forward. So finally, my outsider-insider perspective on the last year. Uh, as we go forward, I think we finally need to, to accept this, that that debate has been resolved. We will now do the hard and exciting work to establish a sustainable independent Hampshire, or we will close. The other alternatives have been foreclosed. That's the decision we've made, right? To use a terrible martial metaphor, we've burned the ships on the beach, right? The partners are over across the Aegean, we can't get back to them. Right? We're here, we're going to make it, or we're not. And we are going to make it. So. All right, so our work this fall, let me try to, this is, this is the boring part of the speech, so I'll kind of get through this pretty quickly. Uh, we, to go back again to the founding documents, we need a strong and sudden effort. Right? That's a quote actually from Tocqueville. Um, and Tocqueville is in, in, in Democracy America, in America, is talking about communities who know what they need to do and then kind of get trapped in constant conversation and second guessing. He's diagnosing one of the challenges that democracies have that end up often letting promising communities die. And that at some point those communities can survive if, they, if they're willing to take a, a strong and sudden effort. Right, to kind of jolt you out of that democratic inertia in a, towards a democratic means. That's what we need to do now. Uh, so, but there are three constraints that are pushing that, that have some timetables that make our work have to happen quickly. The first is we're being required by external authorities to do so. Right? We uh, raised our hand last spring and said, hey, everybody who, uh, who's concerned about higher education, take a look at us. Right? Come in, look at us. Right? I know you just accredited us, but we don't think we can do it. Right? Well, that was done. So now they're looking at us. Right? And we've been told very clearly that by November, we need to tell both our accrediting agencies and we need to show the Department of Higher Education that we have a path to fiscal viability and educational quality. We have to square that circle in the next seven weeks. And it has to be real. We cannot push this off. So that puts a time frame on this. Secondly, we have to raise a lot of money. Right? Um, you know, we got to raise about $9 million to close the gap this year. $9 million was the gap last year, so that's not new. Uh, and I think we can raise that money. But one of the things that I've found consistently as I talk to people who are interested in supporting the college is they've told me some versions of what, what our creditors have told me, which is, 
I'm eager to support you. I want you to be successful. Show me that I'm not just burning up my money. Right? Show me that when I give you funds, it's to give you a bridge to where you need to be. You don't have to be there yet, but I gotta see the bridge. Right? And then third, we've gotta attract a class next year. Right? We've gotta attract a class that's more than 13. We've gotta make them not work so hard to come here. Right? Uh, and there was a lot of interest in this place. Right? We, had a, we had a really strong set of applications last year. We know how to recruit students who can thrive at Hampshire College. We need to do something that's exciting and visible that can overcome this kind of inertia of, is Hampshire open? You know, are they dying? Right? Should I go there? We need something that will persuade students that we're an exciting place to be. Right? We'll do it. So how are we going to do it? Well, we start, we start working on it today, uh, but between now and the end of October, here's what we need to do. We need to generate together, as, a, as an extended community, some shared conception of our future. Right. Notice I'm not saying, you know, a curriculum or a, you know, a new design or a new model. Try to be careful about how we phrase this. A shared conception of our future, a road map for what we think the next version of Hampshire College will look like that we're then going to build starting in November. Right. Those conversations have to happen on a regular basis. I've set up a schedule for those. That email went out yesterday, I think. Um, and those conversations will be transformed into, by, by this second, this other sort of expanded AIPG group, don't worry about the acronym, um, will be transformed into summary proposals. Right? What did we talk about on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? What would that look like? What would some of those ideas look like if we did them? And then fed back out to everybody. And then we'll talk about them again. And we'll combine those weekly discussions with a couple of opportunities for concentrated focused work where we can bring lots of people together. We'll do one of those on September 19th. My email said the 16th, that was wrong, I had my notes wrong. September 19th, we'll have a couple of opportunities for that. And then October 3rd and 4th when the board is here, we will have several, several open meetings with, with the board where we can try to move from shared conception of the future to something like a couple of possible directions that we actually can make happen. And then by late October, we need to have the roadmap that we're going to work with. And we need to adopt it. Okay? So that I can then go out to our accreditors and to our, our community and get us the next year and a half we need to keep building it. Right? So that's the goal. And if we were in a smaller group, I'd ask if there were any questions about that. Right? Um, Let me say this, some principles to guide those conversations, and I'll share this with people. Um, I don't want to overwhelm people with emails, I'm sending a lot, so, but before we start entering in these conversations, I'll share these, but some basic principles to guide that idea of developing our shared roadmap for the future, our shared conception of what we can be. It needs to be consistent with our mission, right? Whatever we do has to be consistent with the mission of Hampshire College. Fundamentally, it has to honor student-centered, student-guided education, faculty mentorship, and something like a, a rigorous Div 3 project. Those are sort of the, the eternal truths, I think, of, of a Hampshire education. Um, we have to honor that and then build around it. Secondly, whatever we do has to be unique. We're already unique, so we don't have to go, a lot, don't have to go very far in that, but we can't become less unique. Right? <laughs> it needs to be inspiring, right? So, for example, we need to be able to say, come to Hampshire and solve the existential problems that your generation faces. You don't have to wait four years, right? Start right away. Maybe that's not, right? So something like that, something that makes people go, yeah, not just this educational model is amazing, not just this community is amazing, but I can start doing meaningful, authentic work of the kind that I'm going to college to do later, and I can start doing it now, right? It needs to be accessible. We need to figure out a way to build a model that everybody who can benefit from a Hampshire education can come. We need to prioritize fairness internally, and what I mean by that is that we need to 
figure out a version of Hampshire College that allows us to compensate people equitably and fairly without asking them to do excessive amounts of work. Again, that's a, that's a great applause line. Recognize that that probably means that we can't employ as many people or do as many things, right? So there's a tension in these principles, right? I mean, if we have to live within our means and we want to not ask people to do three jobs, then we have to have fewer jobs to be done. Right? So this is the last principle of this, is that we have to come up with something that's sustainable that doesn't look like in another two years you're going to have a $9 million gap. Right? So that's kind of roughly how we need to think about this. And it's a hard project, but you know, if anybody can do it, we can. All right, so my role in that is connect those conversations, generate enthusiasm while also you know, being realistic about things. So enthusiasm tempered with realism. Hoping I'm striking that balance. Uh, and then run, raise a whole lot of money. Your role is to engage one another with goodwill and respect. We cannot do this successfully if we don't engage with one another charitably and assume the best of one another. Right? We have to do that or we will not make this work. And your role, I hope, is to aspire to a shared vision in the best sense. Right? That when we come out of this process, I hope everyone is willing to see themselves in whatever shared vision we come up with. And if there isn't the thing that you would do that you're willing to accept an outcome as long as it doesn't violate your deeply held fundamental principles. We're not all going to get what we want out of this. But we got to get enough that we can recognize and say, that's not what I would have done. But I can see my vision of Hampshire in that version of it. I'm willing to work on that together with everybody else. And today is the first step in that process, building some trust. So, to finish up here, I believe in Hampshire College. I believe our society needs Hampshire College now more than it ever has. I refuse to accept the idea that what we do no longer has a place or that students no longer need Hampshire. And I came here to do this epic work with you. We have to convince the world of our necessity and we have to build a Hampshire College that can thrive in that world and we start that today. Thank you.